All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the research program manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center located in Newport, Oregon. Um, today's event is a hybrid event, so we also have folks online. Welcome to everybody that's out there and joining us wherever you happen to be. Um, if you happen to be online and you're having any technical issues, we have a volunteer. Roseanne is here. Uh, Roseanne will help with any of those questions. So if you put them into the chat box, she'll help you navigate that. She'll also help you with any questions you might have for today's speaker. So you can put questions into the chat box at any time and we'll ask them at the end of today's presentation. For folks in the room, because this is a hybrid event, that means that when it's time for us to have questions, you also need a mic. So just remember to raise your hand if you have a question and I'll run around and I'll bring this mic to you. And that way folks online can hear those questions as well. If you don't wanna wait for me, you're also welcome to use the mic stand that's right there. So just one of those to make sure that everybody can hear. Um, also just a reminder, if you haven't done it already to make sure you sign in as you come in, um, that basically is just an accounting for our cookies and our coffee, um, but also for students that are taking this for credit, that is one way that we know that you were here. So make sure you sign in. Um, quick announcement for, uh, before I hand it off for today's speaker. I wanted to promote next week's um, seminar, uh, which will be on November 9th. We have Harvey Kelsey, who's coming down, coming up um, from the Department of Geology from Cal Poly um, Humboldt, who's going to be talking to us a little bit in line with what we're talking about uh, here today, um, but evidence for recent developments and across the Yukuna Bay Fault. So there's a fault in Yukuna Bay, and there's been some changes, and he's going to come talk to us about that. Um, so that will be pretty interesting. But for today, um, our speaker works closely with somebody that many of you might recognize. Felicia is here. Um, she is the uh, what is your official title? Coastal, <laughs> Coastal Hazard Specialist. Um, with Sea Grant, and her office is across the river here. And so she is the one that's actually going to introduce today's speaker. So I'm going to hand it off to her. And uh, we're so glad that our speaker is here today. Thank you. So yeah, I know Adi pretty well, but I, I have more like a formal bio to share with you all. <laughs> So, Ali Burgos is the project manager for the Cascade Jacobs Hub with Oregon State University. She manages the hub to foster collaboration and connections with coastal communities from Northern California to the Salish Sea in Washington to increase community adaptive capacities to coastal hazards. So, she has to deal with a lot of people and manage a lot of projects and people, which is a lot of work. Um, Prior to joining OSU, she was with the University of California, Santa Barbara Marine Science Institute as the project coordinator for the Regional Ecosystem Science Observation Network. Before that, Ali was a Sea Grant Canos Fellow, where she supported NOAA's Effects of Sea Level Rise program. Graduating with a Bachelor of Science from Rutgers University in Meteorology and an MS in Physical Oceanography from Old Dominion University. Please welcome Adi. Thanks, Felicia. So I have this mic on and I just wanna make sure that everyone can hear me well. Perfect. So now, as you might've guessed from Felicia's intro of me, I grew up on the East Coast and I moved to Portland in 2020. When I first moved here, I was living in a hotel for two weeks, trying to find an apartment. And in Googling my newfound city, I came across a Pulitzer Prize winning New York article that you might have heard of titled, The Earthquake That Will Devastate the Pacific Northwest. And I'm like, oh my God, where on earth did I move to? Because growing up in the East Coast, I was fascinated and drawn to studying sea level rise and nuisance flooding, and I thought very little about earthquakes or tsunamis. But once I was aware of the threat, I tried to learn as much as I could. For those that aren't familiar, we have two tectonic plates that are pushed against each other, the Juan de Fuca plate off of the coast and the North American plate. When these pl where these plates meet is called the Cascadia subduction zone or the CSZ, where this fault zone has a potential to create a magnitude nine earthquake. Now, the magnitude of an earthquake, for those that aren't familiar, is reported on a logarithmic scale. So that means a earthquake at eight, at a scale of eight, is 30 times more powerful than a 7.0 quake, 
and a magnitude 9 is 900 times more powerful than a magnitude 7 quake. Now, the CSC is actually really only been started to be studied since the 80s. We know that the last big event happened 322 years ago or so, and these large ruptures happen every 300 to 500 years. And this is going to affect Northern California all the way up to British Columbia. Now, there's about a 15% chance of this occurring in the next 50 years but an 85% chance that a destructive earthquake, though lower magnitude, will happen somewhere in Cascadia in the next 50 years. Now we're prone as people, when we hear that statement in the next 50 years, that this event could happen at the tail end of that 50 years. But in reality, it could happen next month, or it could happen in 50 years, or even another 100, 200 years. We're not entirely sure of when. But as I mentioned before, the CSZ rupture would be huge. So who has experienced an earthquake before in the United States? Okay, a fair amount of everyone in the audience raised their hand. Um, uh, let's go right here to Cinnamon. How long did that earthquake last? Three minutes, that's still pretty long. What about someone up here that raised their hand? Someone else want to shout out a number? Anything? What did you feel? Just a few seconds. A few seconds? Lights are swaying. What else? Anyone else? 15, 30 seconds? Yeah. So generally, what we feel, at least here in the Pacific Northwest, are not too long. But a magnitude 9 would produce shaking for about five minutes. So. Think about that for a second. Everything is shaking for five minutes. No fun for nobody. And that is something that is going to greatly impact our lives, our infrastructure, and the earth itself. And so with such a large change, even though this is a rare occurrence, it still has the potential to have lasting and deep consequences for us, which is why we want to study it and help to prepare people in the event it does happen. So while we can't say exactly when it might happen, we can be more prepared for when it does. Unfortunately, earthquakes, tsunamis are not the only thing that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. There are several other hazards, including erosion, landslides, and sea level rise, which is affecting flooding and storm surge. These are just a few videos of different flood events happening in the Pacific Northwest area. So all of these coastal hazards are something that are either chronic, acute, it's some, some of these things are what we see every single day living here, which is what gives us in part such a beautiful landscape. And this is what brings me to my project, the Cascadia Coastlines and People's Hazard Research Hub, which I'm just gonna call the hub going forward. So we just started our third year of this five-year project, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. And it's bringing together researchers from all of these different universities and organizations that you can see at the bottom of the screen. And again, I'm with Oregon State University. So our main goal is to help Pacific Northwest coastal communities prepare and adapt to coastal hazards through research and community engagement. And we're striving to contribute to communities' resilience while still upholding their identities, their needs and values, and we're also informing hazard assessments, mitigation, and adaptation measures that we're collaborating with various stakeholders in the coastal communities. So we're testing two ideas. One, that advancing coastal hazard science will transform communities' understanding of these coastal risks they face. And two, by taking a more inclusive and co-produced approach to hazard science and mitigation, a community's ability to adapt will increase and it will also help, hopefully, broaden people's participation in getting more involved in hazards work. Now, supporting these communities and conducting this research in this space is a big undertaking. And luckily, we have over 100 people now working towards these goals from undergraduate students all the way up to senior researchers who are all working on bits of these coastal hazard issues. So we have five interconnected teams. First team is looking at geohazards, so earthquakes, landslides, tsunamis. Team two is inundation and coastal change, so sea level rise, flooding, erosion. 
three is community adaptive capacity. So that's helping communities actually prepare, respond, and recover from these hazards. And then team four is trying to bring in more underrepresented students into STEAM. And if you're not familiar with STEAM, it's STEM, but A is standing for arts. And then finally, team five, which is technically everyone who's involved with the hub, is working towards more, more co-production. So working with different people in other disciplines, working with community members to really engage everyone and produce more novel work and novel solutions. So while people are working on specific projects, teams are connecting and working together in transdisciplinary research, again, aimed all at making more resilient communities here in the Pacific Northwest. So this research is going from Northern California all the way up to Northern Washington. It is a very large region though. And so we're focusing on a few select areas to conduct several or the majority of our research projects that, I'm, that we're calling collaboratories and which are highlighted in the blue bubbles on the map. So these areas were picked either because of existing research already being done in the area and partnerships that have been created to help us kind of kickstart a lot of the work that we want to do, which is really important so that we can refine and expand that work beyond the collaboratories. Now, this does not count out some more Cascadia-wide research though, especially when it comes to things like earthquake and tsunami modeling. So preparing for the really big one is a question that we ask ourselves in our work. So again, really big one is that magnitude nine earthquake happening on the Cascadia subduction zone, rare but high consequence event that could dramatically change the entire coast. And unfortunately, we do know the devastating effects that an earthquake of this magnitude could have because it has happened before. In 2011 in Japan, they had a magnitude nine quake strike off the coast of Japan and amazingly, 94% of people living in the tsunami inundation zone lived due to their good planning and public awareness of these hazards. For us in the Pacific Northwest, we're not at the same level of planning and public awareness yet. But the work that the scientists are doing in the hub and well beyond the hub will help us get there. So this brings me to our first team. So for the rest of this time, I'm gonna be going through some of the different projects that, and research that the hub is working on to get to this more resilient coast in the Pacific Northwest. So team one is studying geohazards to support multi-hazard planning and mitigation through models and various simulations. So their goals are to uh, first advance their understanding of Cascadia earthquakes, tsunamis, and landslides. Um, developing realistic scenarios for what those future hazards might look like. And then the second is to enable comprehensive coastal multi-hazard planning and mitigation through advanced probabilistic simulations. So they're simulating what these planning and mitigation adaptations might look like in various scenarios. So quickly through this, there's several different uh, sub goals for team one. Um, such as uh, identifying onshore and offshore faults, updating vertical land motion, and estimating recurrence intervals. And then also in uh, our second goal, trying to find earthquake uh, tsunami simulations, making those better, and having looking at impacts of shaking on infrastructure and tsunami debris forecasting. So all of that kind of translates into some of these sub questions that this team is asking. So things like how much time is actually available for evacuation and does that time change with different types of ruptures? So depending on where that fault ruptures will change the time that the tsunami might arrive at the shore. And then how well does a building or bridge actually hold up after an earthquake to a tsunami? So these are just an example of some of the questions that our researchers are asking. Now, one of the issues with a major earthquake and tsunami is that certain locations will effectively become an island because roads and bridges will be damaged. And so people and supplies will struggle getting in or out of an area. And so one of our previous PhD students, Dylan Sanderson, asked those questions of how a magnitude nine quake will impact our local and regional connectivity. So what does that mean? Our local connectivity is how easily would I be able to get to a healthcare facility in my community, for example. And regional con connectivity is how easily could I get to my family's house that lives in town across the river, for example. 
And so using um, various models, he modeled what this could look like post earthquake. And here are the results for Newport. So what we see here is the RCI, which is again, how accessible are places outside of your community. And his metric for determining that was how connected to airports you would be post quake. So if you're looking at the middle map, zero is completely disconnected and one is pre-earthquake travel time. Now Newport could take up to two years to get to see that pre-earthquake regional connectivity again. The plot on the right shows how long it takes for that RCI to hit 0.75, which basically means how long it could take for a community to become an island, basically. And Newport is about 1.5 years. And again, that is based on your access points to airports. Now, understanding these post-disaster effects is critical to make our communities more resilient today and to have more plans in place for people. So as you know, we deal with chronic hazards as well. So earthquakes, tsunamis, those are acute hazards and our chronic hazards are our sea level rise or our storm surges that are affected by sea level rise. And so that second team is looking at exposure to flooding and coastal change hazards with a couple of goals. One is to measure that risk of flooding and sea level rise so we can better understand the impacts on communities and the coastlines and habitats themselves and then also looking at how natural and nature-based features like salt marshes can support the resiliency of communities. Marshes and dunes help to reduce wave energy that might be coming in from storms, for example. And so this is one project um, that I get really excited about because we know that flooding and erosion will increase, but a major question is by how much. And so the work that I'm going into is mainly being done by one of our PhD students, Meredith Leung. And so to assess chronic hazards like erosion, we can look at what she calls these hazard proxies. And so these proxies let us use simple threshold calculations to determine whether hazardous conditions are being met or not. And so we look at unsafe beach hours. So when the beach is too narrow to play or to work, and that's when a beach width is less than 10 meters, around 33 feet. And then collision hours is a proxy for erosion. And that's when le water levels are higher than the base of the dune, but the water isn't going over it. And then overtopping is our proxy for flooding. So that's when the water levels are now higher than the top of the dune and can flood behind it. So she mapped this for the entire Pacific Northwest using a model called Tesla, she created estimates of how these proxies will change in the future. So the first photo on the your left um, shows how these proxies, um, or shows the baseline of now. So this is if there's no sea level rise. Oops, sorry. Um, and then comparing from that baseline, we can then see how these hazards might change based on 0.5 meters, one meter, and 1.5 meters of sea level rise. Now under all of the sea level rise scenarios overtopping or O, um, the flooding remains rare, mostly due to large dunes in the region and lack of tropical cyclones, which would allow storm surge to really flood behind those dunes much more easily. But we do see unsafe beach hours and collision hours really start to increase. So this is from an average of hazardous conditions, which are now at 20%. And based on that sea level rise scenario, so based on how much we'll actually see in the future, the percent of these different hazards will start to increase, as you could guess, as we have more sea level rise. So stakeholders have expressed a need to identify the areas that aren't currently experiencing hazards, but will in the future. And that is so important because those areas might be underprepared for those increasing coastal hazards because they don't have current experience with dealing with them now. And so this research is starting to identify those potential areas, along with finding hot spots where we could expect a significant higher impacts from hazards in the future. So that's just one example of our uh, chronic hazards from team two, but there are several other projects going on, such as understanding how changes in river shape could affect flooding, how dynamic revetments can reduce wave energy and stop or slow erosion, monitoring nearshore and beach changes, and evaluating how marine ecosystems and the services they provide will evolve 
um, in response to various sediment processes. So discussing these chronic hazards with communities and understanding their perceptions and their local knowledge has been a critical aspect of the hub and we're working with communities to understand their needs even more. So for example, we just had a group from this team go out to the Marine Resource Committee Conference in Westport, Washington, and hub members were able to present their work and get direct feedback from the community and from that group that's gonna help inform our work even more. And then the last research specific team is team three, who's looking at the adaptive capacity of communities. So their overall goal is to increase coastal communities ability to prepare, respond and recover from these chronic and acute hazards. And so this is where most of our social scientists kind of fall into. So they have several main goals, um, including things like integrating different worldviews into disaster risk assessment, making tools for people to evaluate different strategies to help them pick the best adaptation one, building more capacity of local governments to create more equitable adaptation strategies, and finally, determining approaches that will best strengthen communities who will likely be isolated after a disaster event. And so one of the projects I'm excited about is engaging with the Latino community in Clatsop County. There's been a 36% increase in Hispanics in Clatsop County over the past few years, with many employed in low wage place-based industries that are primarily located in high tsunami risk areas due to tourism. And so this project is trying to recognize Hispanic residents' cultural values and lived experiences and assess how this affects their engagement with existing preparedness resources. So we are co-producing new hazard materials and trying to find better ways to disseminate this information, which will be shared with Hispanic residents and emergency management offices. Now our PhD student Josh Blockstein was heavily doing this work along with Felicia here. Um, and so they started with reviewing uh, English and Spanish versions of 70 different existing earthquake and tsunami awareness, preparedness and response resources from federal, state and local agencies. They then had community focus groups along with surveys to review these resources, the layouts of it, language complexity, cultural relevance, and from that, they found that the Latino community wants and needs their community and neighborhoods to start to get more organized. They also want more resources and trainings in Spanish, um, more information on alerts, evacuation routes, first aid, um, how to put together emergency kits and family emergency plans. And so directly from this, um, this led to a new hazard training videos being created with direct help from Latina community members being actresses in these videos. And so further, there's going to be community workshops to present these findings um, of these almost finished products and shared with, your, with their local emergency managers. Team three has so many more projects again, um, and these are that was just one of them that I get really excited about. But here are a few examples of some more. Um, so we have people looking at sea level rise adaptation processes in Humboldt Bay in Northern California through an equity lens. We've had people participate in tribal public health emergency preparedness listening sessions, developing decision support tools to help evaluate local adaptation strategies and much more. Now, the last bit of that you might have remembered from the beginning is that we are trying to broaden participation of underrepresented students into STEAM and particularly into coastal hazard awareness and resiliency research. So we have this program called the Charter Fellowship Program. Uh, Charter stands for Coastal Hazards and Resilience Training, Education and Research. And so we've, this has been very successful with 19 current and past fellows in the program over the past two years. And students are rec uh, recruited from our four major universities associated with the hub. And they I either identify underrepresented in color, nationality, gender, or income status. And so they're able to learn about the natural hazards and connect with researchers across the universities. Um, and they're also able to go into research after their first year of the fellowship. 
And so each year they have to go through a various class and coursework, but then they also get to have a boot camp. So the fellows get to come down to the coast for two to three days and they get to learn about ongoing disasters, hazard and resilience research, tour facilities and meet key stakeholders in the area to help them learn and gain various skills that's going to help them later on in, if they choose to do research. And so last year we had our boot camp here in Newport. They got to tour this facility and go uh, up the vertical evacuation structure here. And then uh, this year they went to Westport in Washington. So as a plug, we're actually recruiting our next round of fellows. So applications are due on Friday, November 17th, which you can find all the information on our website. And I'm happy to talk more about that again for undergraduate students. So the last thing I want to share is that we have a pathway for people to connect with our hub members if someone needs coastal hazard support. This could be with research, science communication, um, or technical assistance. We actually have postdocs that have 50% of their time committed to supporting the requests that come in, along with the support from our Sea Grant uh, leads and other researchers in the hub. And just to give you an example of what one of these looked like, we had a request come in from Yahats, so just the small town just south of here, um, looking for support to understand landslide risk better in their area. And so one of our postdocs was able to help translate the current science into a more digestible format for their city planners. And so those requests can be either submitted on our website or being directly reached out to a hub member. So this is really only a small sample of all the different work and all the different projects and connections that are going on within the hub. But what I find so cool about this project is that people aren't conducting research in a silo, which can tend to happen in academia. People are really trying to learn how their work can connect to others, either other researchers or community members, city planners, uh, and government. So for example, our coastal erosion folks or tsunami debris modelers are learning from each other or connecting with our social scientists and vice versa. And we're really actively learning from community members of what their needs are, where the research needs to be met and put and ensuring that they're the ones that are actually benefiting from this work. So doing all of this, managing over hundred people is not easy. Trying to make those connections isn't easy, but solving complex issues really never is, right? And so the members of the hub are trying to make steps towards making sure that we are a more resilient, have a more resilient future for the Pacific Northwest. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much, Ali. We have some time for questions. So this is a great uh, opportunity for you all to ask Ali any questions, Felicia questions. If you have questions for me about the vertical evacuation structure that you're sitting in. Um, so please let us know if you have any questions. We're gonna bounce back and forth between questions online and questions in the room. So if you have questions online, remember put them into the chat. Um, questions in the room, just raise your hand. And it looks like Roseanne is ready with a question online. So Roy Zan, go ahead. I'm guessing that Newport Airport is not factored in here. An emergency management panel discussion a few years ago referenced the Newport Airport being updated as the airport in Japan was to make it quickly usable for emergency services to use. Is this not factored in here because it might not be an airport available for immediate use by the public? So is the question is if the air if the Newport Airport was um, put into consideration for that model work? Yes. Um, that I'm so I will make a plug that because as the program manager and I help manage all of the people, I'm not actively involved in the research. However, um, we do have I can connect you with anyone on the hub to answer those specific questions. So unfortunately, I cannot say if it was or not but they do have, uh, all of this work was already published and is out. And so it's something that I could very easily find for you after this. We also have somebody else in the audience that might be able to help us a little bit. Do you want to introduce yourself and then answer your question? Sure. Thank you, Laura. Hi, my name is Laura Gable. I'm a geologist with the Oregon Department of Geology. And Dan Cox is a professor with OSU, I believe, who led the yep. connectivity work. And 
I believe that the Newport airport wasn't included in that calculation of that like long-term resilience. It's more about like ODOT's priority of which roads they're going to repair regionally and how people on the coast are going to be getting to the more major hospitals and airports. I believe that's how that worked. And um, the Newport airport is being prepared to be able to receive supplies immediately following the event with like putting gravel down even to make it a usable runway if it's if the asphalt has been disturbed. But I don't believe it was used for that kind of long-term, like one to two year recover recovery index that they that she showed in that slide. Thanks, Laura. All right, questions in the room. I just wanted to follow up on that uh, question and perhaps you might be better to answer it than, than Allie. Um, I, I noticed that uh, Astoria was a much shorter time period, right, in terms of that. And there, they, there is an airport right there in Astoria. And so I guess part of the question, and I also understand that Astoria, I mean, it's that's a fairly low airport, though, as well. And whereas Newport is much higher. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out if that airport was part of it or if it was still all roads to more major airports, uh, specifically PDX, um, I guess. I can't remember about that. And I remember hearing Dan or someone else talking about hospitals and you mentioned hospitals too, Allie, mm -hmm. was it, were they both included at the same time or were they kind of broken out separately? I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely positive. Okay. I, they might've been broken out separately. I think, you know, one thing that Allie did touch on was the local connectivity versus regional connectivity. And I think in the local connectivity, there is they do consider local airports and hospitals and, you know, kind of local, being able to collect as a group within a single community versus getting out of the coast altogether and getting to the valley where there are more services available and PDX, you know, that sort of thing. Right. As you, ima as you could imagine, the local connectivity, so getting within your community would bounce back much faster than getting to other places as roads and bridges take a while for repair. I think if you have detailed questions about that particular study, Dan Cox would be a good one to answer or reaching out to Ali yeah. uh, and the research hub. Uh, question on the all of the publications by uh, team members in the hub available on the hub website? They are going to be in a month. <laughs> we're, we're updating our website right now. Thank you. And so all the publications specifically will be there. You can read about specific projects on our website, but that's just um, summary versions and then publications will be linked very soon. All right, Roseanne has a question online. Are there any connections between sea level rise and shifts in tectonic plates? Could climate change advance the timeline of the next earthquake? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, as far as I'm aware, sea level rise does not have an effect on tectonic plates. Um, and so I would not expect there to be a climate change effect on something like the Cascadia subduction zone event. All right, questions in the room. I'll get to you in a sec. I got one up here though. Cinnamon's doing God's work right now, running around with a mic. I had one earlier. It was just kind of tied to the earlier conversation because it had Astoria, it had Newport, and then it had Gold Beach. So I was thinking about Astoria had a, a quicker recovery time per se, maybe due to proximity to Portland. But to me, Gold Beach was kind of the, I was curious about that. Like, what is it about uh, that particular area, uh, it had, it kind of fell in between. Astoria had the shortest time. Uh, Gold Beach was in the middle and Newport was the longest of the three. So it was just a curious, I just am curious about it. Yeah. So for that, I would again reference just the specific papers of what exactly they're um, looking at. So, I mean, that could really depend on several factors like, again, airports. It could also be 
the different roads that are either currently updated or not updated, different bridges that are allowing you to get in and out of areas. Um, but I will make sure for all of the people that have asked specific questions on that to give you the publication link uh, exactly. All right, questions online. What is the main thing we need to do to make us as prepared as Japan was in 2011? That's a great question. Um, so I think that there's a lot of different ways that people could answer this or to go about answering this. So I'm gonna answer from my point of view. Um, and so that kind of comes from my heart is really that I feel that a lot of people have lost touch with our ocean and people have lost touch with their connectedness to nature. And again, that's a very personal opinion. But I think that a lot of other cultures feel that and they're more inclined to learn about the natural hazards that are there. On the scientific side, there's a lot of things that we can do in our research. There's a lot of things that we can to learn more about um, for the specifics of how we will be affected in a, you know, in a tsunami event. Um, communication is a huge one. And that's something that the hub is really trying to do is to connect people and connect researchers to make sure that we are more prepared. It's things like making sure that all of that hazard training and resources is put into different languages as well, not just Spanish, but French, all of the um, Asian languages, you know, getting that information out. A lot of it starts in the classrooms as well. So having more education material, because as kids start to learn things, they will then share that with their parents. They'll go home and say, hey, this is what I learned today. And so there's a lot of different areas that we can slowly improve upon. I mean, everyone coming here today is an amazing start because you start to learn something new and then you can share that with other people. And so in some ways it's grassroots effort of people talking and feeling more connected and aware. And on another side, it's what our agencies can do, what we can put money towards for research and what we can put money for if different adaptation strategies too. So it's a very, I think, complex question that can be looked at in a various, various way. Great, questions in the room? Hi, um, could you help me understand the relationship between coastal community identity and how it would influence your community adaptive strategies? Yeah, so for example, uh, a Latino community might value their um, church more, or they might value their neighbor's house more. And so they're more likely to go to, in the face of a disaster, they might be more likely to go to their church or their neighbor's house than seeking out specific government resources. And so making sure that we understand what people value in their community, then we can, you know, this is just one example, but say, hey, if everyone in this community is going to head to their local church, if in the face of a disaster, maybe we should check to make sure that it's going to withstand an earthquake or if it's a tsunami uh, zone or things like that. Great question online, Roseanne. Some of those photos look pretty devastating and the water came very far inland. Is the Hatfield evacuation building large enough to withstand a magnitude nine earthquake and tsunami? Cinnamon, do you wanna take that? Sure. Um, so based on the models that we have for this particular location, um, worst case scenario at a nine plus earthquake, uh, we're expecting 20 minutes after the ground starts to shake a 28 foot tsunami. The building is 47 feet tall at its roof. So yes. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> All right. We have a question in the room here. Thank you. Uh wonderful talk. Uh, I'm curious, and this builds off of one of the previous questions a little bit regarding either uh, lower income communities, communities with members who not everyone speaks English, um, or even I think back to the fires of 2020 in Southern Oregon, the destroyed mobile home communities. Um, are these different groups or smaller communities within the larger communities being uh, sort of targeted in different ways? And are they, how are the resources being presented to them as in terms of uh, the different risks of the community they live in? And is there a sense of whether or not those members of those communities 
live in higher risk areas of these regions. Yeah. So do you want me to Yeah, there's a lot of parts to that question. I guess are the so, are those community members in higher risk areas? Yes. And are they being uh, given information that is specific to the areas they're in. Right. So, I mean, depending on what community you're, look, you're looking at, it tends to be underrepresented communities do live in higher risk areas. So but Latin communities will live in, like I showed, um, it's very workplace based. So they would be living in those tsunami evacuation zones because that tourism industry brings them in. And so they're living in those areas. Um, you also have uh, black people tend to live in higher density housing that might not be with uh, withstanding of an earthquake, for example. Um, in terms of the hazards that they are presented with, because we are targeting coastal communities, a fair amount of the same hazards are being presented to various groups, depending on what team is reaching out and talking with them. Um, and I know that there were some other parts to that question I wanted to get at um, that answer most of it. Or... Yeah, so I think the only other like bits of nuance would yeah. be um, if the like severity of the hazard in those areas is higher than other areas. You know, how is that communicated clearly? And then in those communities where not everyone speaks English how how uh, difficult is disseminating that information yeah. from the English speakers through to the non yes. Um, Well, if you're not coming to State of the Coast on Saturday, you should, and you should come to our session because we're going to be talking specifically about that. Um, so for uh, Hispanic communities are the PhD student, Josh, he is fluent in Spanish. And so that whole, all of the workshops and focus groups with that community were all conducted in Spanish. Um, those groups also really tend to need like childcare, and so that is given during the group. So it kind of make helps for people to be able to join. Um, we also had a group, uh, the one that we'll be talking about on Saturday with the mom indigenous Guatemalan community. And so it is difficult with translation because we're going from Spanish to then another translator that can translate into their indigenous language. Um, and so things can get lost, but for the most part, I believe everything has been going. I mean, you'll hear more on Saturday, um, but it does present a challenge, right? And it is something that you have to think through very carefully to be able to talk with those communities about the hazards that are in the area. How you present hazards um, really depends on the group that you're talking to. So I wasn't at those focus groups. Um, Felicia and Laura could talk more about how they're presented, but we do think about every community that we're going to and how to present that. So it's not a one size like, hey, we're gonna give this exact same information to every single person. Um, we tailor it. I was gonna ask Laura or Felicia to talk a little bit about the beat the wave mapping that's been happening because that is another product that is very uh, specific down to the road level about what is your risk, at least for the tsunami. Um, so Cinnamon is asking if for me to talk about evac tsunami evacuation modeling that my agency has been working on for a long time now, over about a decade, um, working specifically in one community at a time, um, using GIS analysis, um, plus, you know, walking specific routes to identify how far people need to go from every location in the tsunami zone in a community, how far they need to go to get to high ground, and we have really detailed information about when the wave is arriving in different locations and distance divided by time is a speed. So you can get it how fast people need to travel. And um, so we use this to just kind of provide like a base, a background information about a community. And then you can start to highlight which areas are in extra need. They are more vulnerable. They are further away from high ground or there is a specific population of people that will have additional challenges to evacuate from their location, even if it's not maybe the furthest from high ground in a community. And before this building was built, obviously the Hatfield Peninsula is was quite far from high ground, Safe Haven Hill or the community college were the only options. And um, I did my work like right as the building was being built. Um, but uh, just helping to use that information to inform where you're putting signs on the ground and how you're targeting your outreach to different communities of people. 
Is that clear? And so we've been putting that information online. We've tried to figure out because we're learning that people's map reading skills and interest in getting maps. That's where I was going, Felicia. Thank you. And we got this information online and put it on a smartphone app. I'm very humbled by what it takes to actually like make and manage and upkeep a smartphone app. We don't do it even, but just trying to get our data on it has been really hard and even maintaining it. Um, but yes, yeah, so you can go to, um, well, you could go to OregonTsunami.org. Now it's Oregon.gov slash Dogami, D-O-G-A-M-I. <laughs> From there, you can get to all of the tsunami maps that Dogami makes. But one thing, um, one of the questions online was about how we could be more prepared like Japan. And I really loved Ali's answer about connection with nature and the oceans. I think that was really, um, I, I think that's really meaningful and, and would help a lot. And another thing that Japan um, has over the Pacific Northwest is experience with these. They've had several, you know, many of these, they've been documenting them, sharing that information through the generations. Um, and it's become a ingrained part of their society and their culture to practice their evacuation drills. The communities in Japan that practiced evacuating, they had higher rates of survival and, um, that there's just no substitute for that. And, you know, we're just slowly building that now here because we were not here for the last one. Westerners were not here for the last one. So they also are totally comfortable engineering their coastlines with putting industry at the shoreline and putting people a little further back, which we will never do here. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. So if you want to look at any of those maps, um, out in the lobby, we have the beat the wave and the inundation maps, so you can kind of see those. Okay, so there are a couple more questions in the room, a couple more questions on the line. Hang on, everybody. Hi. Are, are you looking at the uh, ability of the insurance industry to keep up with a uh, disaster? Am I, say that first? Looking at the ability of the insurance industry. Are you interacting with the insurance companies on any of this analysis? For example, where you draw a tsunami line fault is probably pretty, or line is probably pretty interesting to them. And can they keep up even with a disaster of an eight or a nine or whatever? Yeah. As far as I'm aware, no one with the hub is working directly with insurance agencies. I could be wrong. People are doing a lot more research outside of their hub work, um, so I can't speak directly to that. I know, at least on the East Coast, like the National Flood Insurance Program um, is hurting a lot. Um, so I can really, I really only personally know about East Coast for flooding, but out here, I'm not too sure, but Laura might be able to speak more. Just a little bit. Um, the FEMA is trying to quantify the risk from tsunami. It's very difficult because of the low recurrence interval. There's just not the data to create those, um, you know, all their, their math voodoo that they do to build those insurance tables. Um, but I was just at a meeting this summer and FEMA came to talk about their national risk index and they are trying very hard to do this right now. And um, they're in pretty early stages, but they're trying to assign vulnerability, you know, values to different communities on the coast to tsunami. And it's a complicated and contentious issue. And there's a lot of, you know, questions on all sides about it. And I, I can't speak to it any more than that, but it's an interesting, it was interesting to be a fly on the wall and listen to um, FEMA and the scientists go back and forth about it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, question online. I know that there are very few vertical evacuation buildings here along the West Coast. Is there any research being done by the hub on building more vertical evacuation buildings? So we're not doing research specifically on building vertical evacuation structures, but we do have researchers looking at how they can help in an evacuation. So looking at um, the time it could take for people to get from you know, the beach, from example, to safety. And so vertical evacuation towers would fall into that. Um, yeah. Felicia, can you speak to the effort in Washington? So the Westport, uh, are you talking about the Westport vertical evacuation? They're just working on um, moving vertical evacuations uh, 
into communities where they are more than 20 minutes away from safety. And so that's definitely an effort they're working on right now. Um, yeah. But there are two other vertical evacuation structures in Washington, yeah. but those are the only three that I know of. I'm looking at my, yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah. All right. Questions in the room. Yeah. Hi, this kind of follows on vertical evacuation structures or just the smaller communities is the, is co is the hub uh, working with communities similar to like your Yahats example for uh, these communities to apply for grants or for money from federal and state, you know, calls where these communities don't have the resources or experience, but, you know, is Copes Hub working on that side of things of making it easier or giving resources to, uh, to get funds to come and increase the resilience? Yeah, that's a great question because I know that a lot of communities really struggle with having that capacity to be able to apply for grants um, that are out there. Um, and so if someone does come through on our, so the CERC sort of comes through that process and asks for help on that, we can try to provide um, resources and depending, it depends on the capacity that they're asking for. Will we write their entire grant for them? No. Um, but can we help um, them find various resources for the science that they need, um, even going through an edit, things like that, we can. Yeah. Questions online. Does shallower coastal depth have an effect on causing sea levels to rise quicker? Um, no. So sea level rise, um, there's... So you have your general average sea level rise, and then you have your relative sea level rise. And so relative sea level rise is the actual level that you're seeing at your, your specific area, so here for Newport. And so there's various aspects that change what that sea level rise will look like. So your biggest one is thermal expansion, so warming of the water. That's not uniform across the entire globe. Um, it changes and you can see basically a heat map of where that thermal expansion um, affects it. Also melting glaciers have a big impact and that also doesn't um, have a same uniform effect. You have changes in ocean dynamics. So those are things like changing currents. Um, you have vertical land motion. So the actual motion of your coast. So how that is moving is going to affect what that relative sea level rise is going to look like. Um, so if you're thinking that the coast itself, well, one, if a Cascadia subduction zone happened, or for example, that our coast would drop significantly and our sea level rise would immediately jump up. Um, but other than that, we're not going to really see significant changes just from your, do you say the... Um, can you repeat the term that they used? Coastal, shallower coastal depth. Yeah. So it depends to like, vertical land motion does play a very significant part. So you'll see like the East Coast of the United States have a lot more hot spots of sea level rise than out here on the West Coast. So that's in part of the vertical land motion. So land is sinking a lot faster out on the East Coast. Um, and there's various other ocean changes that are happening that's causing that water to rise up faster. It's also a lot flatter, so the water is going to go in further than what you see here on the West Coast, which is everything's a lot steeper. Great. <laughs> we still have lots of questions, so a few more minutes here. Uh, questions, we're going to go all the way up. Hang on just a second. This is kind of recycled from the connectivity talk some time ago, but uh, do you know if anybody in the hub is working on the idea that all of these communities are ports and have access to the sea? So how is that going to affect recovery? If we can evacuate by sea, we don't need an airport. Are the jetties going to disintegrate in a in the big one so they won't have access to the ports anymore? How Who's working on that? Yeah, so we do have people that are looking at specifically tsunami debris modeling. So where will all of the debris go post tsunami? Um, and where is that going to pile up? So in part that helps with cleanup. Um, in terms of actual sea evacuation, I don't know of any hub member that is working on that directly, but we are looking at how the debris might uh, 
what's the word, um, spread out in a community. So that could be then, you know, clogging up ports. Ports most likely would be destroyed. Um, some of them would survive. And so, yeah, it, I know there's other people working on that, but no hub members specifically are. And Laura might be able to speak more on maybe Dogami. Yeah, well, not Dogami, but or, Felicia and I were just whispering about. So Tiffany Brown and uh, is the emergency manager for Clatsop County and Jenny Demaris, the former Clats emergency manager for Lincoln County. They did a project where they reached out to the Navy to talk about um, assistance post-event via the ocean. And um, it was complicated. The Navy was used to coming to help um, like warm weather, calm water places like Puerto Rico or, you know, after the Sumatra event in Indonesia, that sort of thing. Um, but they were working on identifying landing sites with their vehicles to come help. There will, there's no evacuation by sea that will be possible. There's just not time. Um, but the earthquake and the tsunami will uh, probably totally destroy the jetties and also the channels coming into the bays. There will be bank failures in the main channel and um, it's going to take a lot of time to recover the ability to travel in and out of our main marine ports. And I think the core is working on that as well. All right, looks like we have finished our questions online. Any other lingering questions in the room? All right, I got one more up there. Hang on one second. Just a quick question. We're visiting from inland Idaho. I'd never heard of a vertical evacuation tower. And I'm curious how many people fit on the roof. Um, FEMA has authorized our vertical evacuation structure that you're sitting in right now for 920 people. And we have supplies up there to take care of them for up to two days. And that's because we want the tsunami uh, to stop sloshing and so they can safely come on down. So it's really dependent about the square footage um, that you have up there for how many people you can support. Yep. All right, I'm seeing some more questions, but I think what I'm gonna do is um, for folks that are in the room, uh, come up and talk to our presenters. And I'm gonna say presenters because we put Laura on the spot quite a bit today. Thank you, Laura. Um, <laughs> and for folks online, thank you so much for being here. For everybody in the room, if this was something you enjoyed, we do these seminars every single Thursday, same place, same time. Um, and I think next week's talk is also gonna be a really interesting one for us. So I hope to see you again. Let's give our presenters one more round of applause. And thank you, Laura, for being able to give more specific answers to people's <laughs> questions. Um, feel free to reach out if you have more as well online. Great. Always a team effort to answer these kind of things. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>